um, Wales elective optimisation programme. Um, we've been doing one of these once a month for the last few months and sharing um, learning from uh, England um, and uh, various trusts in England as well uh, that we can learn from. So delighted to see um, some of you on the call today. We are recording, um, so we are aware that it's um, the junior doctor strike today, but we made a decision to go ahead because our speakers had, um, were available and we will share the recording um, with all of you, um, which you can hopefully share with colleagues as well. Thank you. Um, so if you can move slides forward, please. Thank you. So just a bit of um, housekeeping. Um, so um, we we will ask the speakers to introduce themselves um, and I'm delighted um, that we've got three speakers from England who've taken time out of their very busy diaries and schedules to come and share some good practice um, with uh, colleagues in Wales today. So that's very much appreciated. Um, as we've said, if you can pop yourselves on mute um, unless you're going to be speaking or asking a question towards the end. We will. Um, we have got some time at the end for a Q and A session. So what we're planning on doing is we'll do all of the presentations and then we'll do a Q and A session at the end, which we've got time for. And as usual, um, if you want to ask a question in the Q and A session, if you can pop your hand up virtually, and then we'll come to you individually. Maybe just introduce yourself and say who you are and what your role is um, and your involvement in the elective optimization program. The chat function will be on there. If you've got any comments you want to make, um, we'll be monitoring that. Um, as I've said, we're recording this. We'll share that afterwards and we'll also share the slides from the meeting afterwards as well. So just moving forward, just briefly show you the agenda for the call. Um, so as I said, delighted to welcome Stella, Lisa and Amit um, to talk you through some of the learning and programmes underway in England. Um, that'll take us to round about 22, quarter to 12, and then we'll have a Q&A session. The next sharing of Good Practice meeting is going to be on the 13th of March, where Professor Briggs will be coming to talk to you about a programme which is called Further Faster in England um, and you'll be hearing all about that next month. Um, so it delights me to really hand you over to Stella now um, and she will uh, give you some updates on some of the work that, that's been um, delivered across England. Thanks very much Stella. Thank you very much and I am absolutely delighted to be here uh, and for various reasons but not um, I'm just going to say, so I'm a Welsh girl. I was born in uh, Bangor, lived in Pamamara all my life. And um, any reason to come back to Wales, you just have to ask and I will come running. So uh, really, really pleased to be here. Uh, and I'm also sorry that you've got strikes today. We uh, have strikes coming up over the weekend and they are draining uh, from clinical operational management uh, and all. And um every time you just learn and you get through. So um, thank you all of you for making time uh, to uh, be on this webinar today. So right procedure, right place. Where did this come from? If we can just go to the next slide, where did this come from? Um, this started with conversations uh, that we didn't have enough theatre staff to do what we needed to do. And we all recognise that as we were coming out of COVID. Staff were burnt out, staff left the NHS um, and we had surgeons willing to go but actually it was often our uh, ODPs and our theatre staff that we just didn't have the right numbers and it was really difficult. We then started looking at safe and appropriate staffing ratios um, across the NHS and we've got AFPP guidelines but they are guidelines and we had learnt through COVID through um, critical care that actually you can do things differently. So we started literally phoning around the world saying, you know, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, China, India, uh, a lot of Europe, Ireland, asking what were their safe and appropriate uh, staffing levels. And what came through loud and clear was that they had different staffing levels and different estate for different procedures. And of course, in the NHS, we have one theatre estate, we have a day surgery unit, and then we have outpatient procedures. And it's been difficult to innovate in that space. So we then started looking at what procedures could be done in a different way and what who what were people doing already? Um, and therefore, we started the conversation of how about we get the right procedure in the right place with the right staffing level and the right to do what we need to do. And so we went through a conversation of phase one, let's just find out discovery, let's find out what people are doing. 
let's then write up those principles and I'll show you the guide that Claire Ogilvy's on the, on the phone. She's done a huge amount of heavy lifting here. Uh, a practical guide, which is the principles on what people are doing, best practice. And then in terms of as we go forward, what do we do next? So if we can go to the next slide. So just want to be really clear about what Right Procedure, Right uh, Place um, did as a programme. This was to move the right procedures out of main theatres if we could, to ensure that if we've got local anaesthetic procedures going on in main theatres, spinal injections, what are the staff and, and what can we move? So again, GERF to produced a guide for hand surgery and what hand surgery procedures can be carried out outside of a, a main theatre environment in a day surgery environment or actually in an outpatient enhanced theatre procedure environment. So how could we move appropriate cases down a gradient of care? If we did that, would we make a fundamental impact on, on the waiting list of, uh, of those low complexity work? Um, and how do we ensure that patients are assured and we are assured that what we are doing um, ensures good governance, but also good patient care. And what we don't do is bring in unwarranted risks such as infection control. So if we can go to the next slide. We've got a, a program of work. We meet uh, monthly. There are action sets that need to happen. And we've been collating case reports and data in terms of uh, where we are. What we haven't done is encompassed um, inpatient stay to day case because that's already in the GERF portfolio and is part of the um, what, what's called the BADS procedures, directory of procedures. And again, each GERF network is championing. So, uh, for example, laparoscopic hysterectomy is done as a day case is the norm for 33% of our uh, provider trusts in NHS England. We need to ask everyone else to do the same because that's what patients are asking us to do as well. So if we can continue to the next slide. So what have we done to date? Um, so we asked our, our, our uh, sites, um, our regions, to identify pilot sites. So these were trusts that were happy to do something differently. We had 13, uh, 30 pilot sites. We had 10 specialities um, from ophthalmology, ENT, general surgery, vascular, uh, orthopedics across the piece. And we'll, we'll go through those now. More than 150 procedures were identified that were being done in a main theatre suite with a three plus one combination of staff occupying major theatre space that could be utilised to manage our more complex but high volume procedures that were taking place that we said that we didn't have space for. Um, and every single region contributed. If we can go to the next slide. So we have now produced the learning from all the pilot sites. It is sitting in the uh, GERFT uh, practical procedure guide. It covers the procedures. If we can go to the next slide. But it also covers um, what people have done and how. And it's the learning that is the most important because you can wish different and have outpatient estate um, with ventilation, without ventilation. You can have staff who are willing to, 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 uh, to do something differently, but they need air cover. And it is difficult in the risk profile that we all sit in to give the air cover to people who wish to do things differently. Well, what we have now is a plethora of case studies where people have done things differently. They have the right governance in place to do this. They've assessed the risks, but actually in doing the doing, they can tell you what is safe and effective and what pitfalls to avoid. And it can help jump the conversation from let's do something that no one else is doing to let's do something that some people are doing and we want to add to that knowledge base. If you go on to the next slide for me. Lovely. So the key themes that we've got uh, from the pilot sites is they have released main theatre and day surgery theatre capacity which has then been backfilled to allow uh, waiting lists to be driven down. Um, they have optimised their staffing ratios. So for some local anaesthetic cases, you may not need an ODP in that theatre, but may need an ODP or an anaesthetist in that space. 
do we now start teaching uh, surgical colleagues uh, to do blocks, especially in orthopaedics uh, and in vascular, rather than having an anaesthetist that needs to do that block? Is that part of a training programme as we go forward? We've utilised fallow spaces um, and it's incredible what spaces people have utilised and we've got two good examples uh, coming through. Um, the cost and environmental impact, we can show now that there is a sustainability difference. Um, people again have started looking at uh, procedure packs that are fit for purpose for what they want rather than theatre packs that are opened in main theatre. And we know through the accreditation process that we're leading through GERFT that there is improved patient satisfaction and staff morale in delivering this care. If we can go to the next slide. Things that we now need to do as we go forward um, are uh, we need to look at the payment systems. So if you are doing things in main theatres and they're coded as a theatre case, if you then move that into what's deemed an enhanced outpatient environment, um, and that might be that it's a mini theatre, how do you ensure that you code that properly? And if it is coded under a different code, that what you don't have is a decrease in payment, so the tariff changes, and actually this is a detriment to the trust, uh, and money is, is obviously important. So the conversation of uh, pricing is important. There will not be any disincentives for this year, um, but we will work on 25, 26 uh, to ensure we've got the right payment tariffs to drive the right behaviours in theatres and no one is challenged to uh, to stop doing this and it be a barrier because the money doesn't flow in the right direction. Next one, please. We're also looking at staffing models. Uh, here you've got the innovative staffing models that are, uh, are taking place and are driving care. Again, there is further detail in the, um, in the um, GERFT principles guide but we are looking to work with, or we are working with um, uh, AFPP and um, Health Education England, which has now become WTE, in terms of how do we develop competencies and credentialing so that people can move between staff groups. And actually, you've got a holistic um, care bundle or a care team that can enable the work that you want to do wherever you want to do it. Um, and again, people have tried and tested and there are things that have not worked and things that have, but they are in the guide. And if we can go to the last one. Thank you. So phase two is we're looking at the people, place and pricing. Uh, the place is important. The definition of the right procedure, right place. It, it's not really an outpatient environment. It's not really an outpatient suite. It's something slightly different, but it's not a day case or a theatre. So we're developing that with a new hospitals programme to ensure that we've got something that is a good definition of that right procedure, right place. And the new hospital programme is actually building capacity that is very different, just as we are in the outpatient model, where an outpatient suite doesn't have to be uh, an outpatient room. It could be a pod where you have a screen and you do virtual reviews with patients or talk to patients on a, on a video. So the, the conversation of what is a theatre suite is also changing as we go forward. So data, um, Clara's put data on the bottom in bright blue for everyone because data is something that we are ensuring that we collate so we can really track what is doing, to, um, what is occurring and the success of what's happening. Um, I'm going to stop there. If we can go to the next slide, I'm going to stop there because actually me telling you all of that is helpful, but not really that helpful. What I really want you to hear from is people who are now doing this and living it. We are living and breathing this in Croydon. We've moved swathes of activity out of our main theatres. But I've got two fantastic colleagues. Um, and if I may, Lisa and Amit, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves as you present. But I really want you to hear from them. And then it'd be really helpful to have any questions. If you want to start putting some questions in the chat or as you uh, as Amit and Lisa um, uh, present would be helpful. And then we'll try and answer all the questions. So Lisa, if I may, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stella. I'm just turning my camera off because I've been having a few IT issues. So whilst the slides are up, I'm just going to be off your screen. So um, good morning. I'm uh, the Quality and Accreditation Programme Lead for Lincolnshire ICB. Uh, Lincolnshire ICB have been running the Community Surgical Scheme for a little over 20 years now. And this is where we've moved high volume, low risk procedures out of secondary care and into the community. 
the scheme has been steadily growing um, and seeing the addition of new providers uh, following the re-procurement that we had um, at the beginning of last year and also with the continual growth of our pre-existing providers. So we now have about 26 different providers across the county. Can go to the next slide, please. I've included these first couple of slides in order to give some background and context to the service. And in this first slide, I've taken a few abstracts out of the contract service specification, which indicate our expectations for the service. And then this next slide, thank you, shows some more locally defined outcomes. So on here, you can see that we've stated, for instance, that um, it's a, a one-stop shop model where possible. So for the majority of our patients, they will be seen and treated by a surgeon at the same appointment slot. There are ex exceptions where this may not be the case, for instance, hernias, um, or where the surgeon feels that it would be more appropriate for a patient to have a se separate consultation prior to the procedure being booked, and that is based on clinical judgment when triaging the referrals, or it could be uh, procedure specific like hernias, or another example, uh, for instance, would be vasectomies where the patient might be seen prior to the procedure date. Next slide, please. We have an accreditation program that sits alongside CSS for all our surgeons that wish to work in the scheme, which has been designed to ensure quality and patient safety by including a framework that all surgeons have to go through. And that's regardless of whether they are a GP with extended skills or a secondary care consultant. I've listed here some elements that we will check, and this is really just to give you a sample of some of the evidence we will ask for. The surgeons are all able to perform under this service once they, sorry, they're only able to perform under this service once um, we have put them their applications through the appropriate due diligence and we are assured and satisfied that they have the necessary competences and skills to carry out the procedures that they have applied to be accredited for. Our surgeons um, also have to re-accredit every three years in order to continue working in CSS and we then reapply the evidence checks at that time. So on the next slide, thank you. At present we've got 53 secondary care consultants accredited and 16 GPs who have extended skills and these figures continue to steadily increase. This slide um, shows a growth of our surgeons. Uh, so I've taken it sort of in the month of May for 2020 up to May 2023. Um, and as you can see, the number of uh, GP surgeons has remained fairly static, whereas we see an increase in the consultants working with us in the community. This is mainly due uh, to the nature of the procedures that are undertaken as they require specific surgical skills and expertise, which GPs don't usually have. The next slide, we um, have just listed out the seven separate specialties that we uh, include in the scheme, and we have about 35 different procedures currently included, um, and all are performed under local anaesthetic, and this slide is really just to give a few of those examples. The next slide, thank you. Um, we have an ICB health protection team, and they inspect and accredit all of our providers' procedure rooms, and this inspection determines what level of procedure the provider can carry out. And these are subject to reaccreditation on a three year basis as well. All the procedures undertaken are, as you can see, level one, two or three. And I've just listed a few examples of those uh, procedures on the slides. The health protection team have a procedure room specification which providers need to achieve before that they sign off their rooms for their CSS service. And to achieve a level three, obviously, they're going to need a higher specification to be reached. So we have two separate accreditation processes in place to give the ICB assurance that the service is safe and that our patient population um, for our patient population when seen in CSS. So next slide, thank you. So this slide I've included because it demonstrates the increase in position uh, provision for our hernia uh, activity. Um, I think I might have skipped a slide there. Could we just go back up? Oh, next one. There, thank you. 
Uh, so this uh, shows um, our activity over a nine year period um, and it indicates activity um, for CSS, but also the corresponding coded activity for our CSS, uh, secondary care providers. Sorry. Our business intelligence support unit have used like for like codes where possible to give as good a comparison as we can get. And as you can see, we, we did have a bit of a dip in 2020-21. Um, when obviously uh, the pandemic hit and we went into lockdown and the service was suspended and this did have a knock-on effect for the following year. So for last year, uh, which was the last full year of activity 22-23, uh, you can see that our activity is starting to uh, increase once again. Next slide, which will be our hernia uh, repairs. Uh, so I split this out, <coughs> excuse me, because um, NHS England were particularly interested in hernias and this gives a good reflection of the steady increase over the last three full years as well. And just out of interest, I did do a quick calculation this morning for our activity so far in the current year to get a full year's activity on an average basis. And we're probably looking at, at around an activity uh, level of about just over 1600 hernia procedures by the end of March, which again is an increase from last year, as you can see, when we had just over 1300. <clears throat> It's also worth pointing out here that the activity seen by our secondary care providers for hernia repair will be the more complex cases that we would not do in the community. And, and just to note here also that all of our hernia referrals go to CSS unless prior approval for a secondary care referral has been gained due to complexity. So as mentioned, hernia patients are assessed in a clinic prior to having the procedure carried out. And if a complex patient does present at that time, the assessing surgeon will onward refer to a secondary care and, uh, and then they'll have their procedure carried out there. Um, but Mr Shukla will uh, be able to tell you a little bit more about his hernia service uh, once um, uh, with one of our providers uh, at Market Raisin. Next slide, please. So although from my perspective, I look at quality accreditation and patient safety within the service, the ICB will also look at the financial aspect, of course, and I'm including this slide to, to demonstrate not only is CSS a more personalised closer to home service for patients, <coughs> excuse me, which can sometimes be provided at their own GP surgery, as we've got 17 providers who are practices as well as CSS providers. Um, but this um, service also gives uh, cost savings as well <coughs> for the ICB, sorry. This um, is also highlighted, <coughs> excuse me, I'm very sorry, uh, on the case study that NHS England designed and published on their future NHS webpage, which is on the next slide. And you did get a glimpse of on um, Stella's uh, slides there. Um, and I realise that obviously this is a lot of information on here and I don't expect you to be able to take it all in. Um, but obviously it's going to be included in the pack, so you'll be able to scrutinise it a little bit more. But you can see that we've used one of our providers, Market Raisin, to give more detailed information. And this is the provider that Mr Shukla works with. Um, and if you can see in the bottom left there under achievements, uh, we did actually make a 5.9 million cost saving for 22-23. And breaking that down a little further to, to specifically look at hernia repairs, we had a cost saving of about 1.3 million just for that uh, type of procedure. It does say on this slide, but just so that you're aware of how we calculated those uh, savings, uh, we used the average cost of each procedure in secondary care, and then we multiplied these by the total CSS activity and then took away the total CSS costs. And that's how uh, we came to our calculated cost savings of 5.9 million. So next slide. Hope that you found that interesting and I'm now going to hand you over to Mr Shukla. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa and Stella. I hope you can hear me OK. Thank you. My name is Amit Shukla. I'm a surgical consultant working at Lincoln County Hospital. I primarily specialize in colorectal surgery, um, uh, laparoscopic and robotic. And in the last five years, I have been doing uh, uh, hernia repairs under the uh, community surgical scheme. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview. I came here to Lincoln as a trainee 
and some local hernias under local anesthetic were being done in the hospital, but a large proportion was being carried out in the community. The surgeons have are a mixed group. There is a breast surgeon who ha, who's uh, multi-talented, can do anything uh, old style. Uh, he works in a community um, hospital and they've got a good setup. It, they used to do more surgery, but I think they only do some uh, CSS work now. There are a few GP surgeries around the county where it is all spread around. We do not do any operations in the main um, hospitals at all. In fact, the, the way this service was picked up by um, my GERFT colleagues was that our hospitals looked really bad because when they looked at our data, they found that we didn't seem to be doing any day case surgery for hernia repairs at all. So that was the only point that my service was commented upon. And then I explained that um, my, uh, well, we don't do this under uh, in the hospital because we sift them all out and do them all in the community. Uh, and they had not, they were not aware of this service. And it was then brought to the attention of the, of my colleagues like Stella, who I'm quite surprised to find that uh, contacted people in India and everywhere abroad, whereas we were, uh, right next to next door to her in Lincolnshire and have been doing this uh, for decades. But Lincolnshire is a rural part of the, uh, the country. Um, th there's a funny anecdote about that as well. Stella, I'm sure you won't remember it. But once upon a time, I came to your trust, to the hospital, to learn about patient assessments. Uh, sorry, the trainee assessments. And I had put in my CV that I have come from Lincoln County Hospital and everybody was very excited to think that a surgeon had, from America had come to learn about foundation ear doctors and were not aware that Lincoln was actually in the United Kingdom. So I had to explain that, no, I'm just from here. Uh, next slide, please. So my, I'll talk to you about my service. Um, I do four hernia repairs in a day. It's done completely under local anesthetic. I do not give sedation. Um, I do not even put in a venflon. In the first year, I used to put in a venflon, and then I found that it was completely unnecessary and wasted 10, 15 minutes of my time, uh, which for something that I did not need to use. Uh, I uh, infiltrate the local anesthetic and then wait for 15 minutes. Um, if we do four in a day. So I don't want to come there twice in a week, so I don't do any special sessions in a, for outpatients. I fit the patients in within my theater day. So when my patient is anesthetized, I will go and see an outpatient at that time. So in that 15, 20 minutes, I see one outpatient. So I see four like that, and at the end of the day, I'll see three more. So I in, incorporate a seven patients OPD within my four patient um, theater day. In my team, I think that um, slide, sl Stella, that you put up, there is a slide error. I have a nurse assisting me as well. So I've got an operating department nurse, or you would have an ODP, whoever is interested to come, and uh, surgery pays for them as well. And I have got two HCAs, um, one to do the circulating, circulating work and hand us any things that we may need. And there is another one to simply sit and chat to the patient. We all want to talk to our patients a lot, and it's actually a very uplifting experience for both all the staff and the patients as well. Because in our hospital, in our hospital appointments, it's become very impersonal. Patients come in; uh, they rarely get a chance to speak to anyone. They have the procedure; they sit there for the whole day. People are doing their different bits of work, and then they are told to go away. Whereas they. Um, seem to enjoy our service quite a lot because yes, although it can be a bit uncomfortable at points, there are always people watching their face and letting me know if there is a problem. And we are all discussing our lives and work that we do. So it can actually be quite a positive experience uh, for the patient. And we specifically rely on members 
who are quite chatty and talk to the patients. We don't want silent people doing their own work um, at the time because the patient then gets naturally very anxious. And because hernia repair is quite a complex thing to do under local anesthetic because it involves me reaching quite deep into the abdominal wall of the patient, it can be a little bit uncomfortable at times. But this is something that I explain in quite detail to the patient on their first appointment saying that this is not going to be like what you are expecting in a general anesthetic, but you will not spend any time recovering because the patients come in, they are not fasted, they come in at the right time, they're waiting for about 10 minutes before the procedure, they lie down, they go into the operating theater after having taken their clothes off and lying down, I operate on them, the anesthetic has worked completely by then, it's completely numb, they get up, they get dressed, and they walk right out again. I've not used any sedation. It's very much, and I do explain it, like an extended dentist visit. And they know that they have to take some paracetamol at home. We, I do not provide any follow-up services because usually it would require secondary care provision. So I ask them to go to the GP or call 999 if there's been a problem. Um, the payment model, uh, I work as an independent contractor. The GP surgery is the um, uh, any qualified provider and they pay me on a sessional basis, but obviously that that will be different in different areas. I am not certain if my all my colleagues get paid in the same way because I have not asked them. Next slide, please. So who do I operate on? Um, in the beginning, I was being quite careful, um, and then as my experience has grown, I am happy to tackle more and more complicated hernias. Um, they, I try to do small to moderate sized inguinal hernias, but moderate to large is also uh, based, it's quite subjective. And uh, what might be a large hernia for me might be a moderate hernia for a colleague who can do them better. Um, and similarly for umbilical hernias. I think it's more important to talk about the hernias that would get sifted out. I haven't actually done any femoral hernias, so I'm not certain that this service is very appropriate for a femoral hernia. So uh, let's move on to the next one, please. When do I reject? So every patient in um, our area would come to the community surgical scheme first. So we select the ones that we can operate on and then send the rest, refer the rest on to a secondary care provider. If the hernia is irreducible, I don't operate on them because it requires their sac to be opened up. And if you can't then get it reduced, then you could potentially be stuck in an embarrassing situation with an inguinal hernia half operated and being moved to the hospital. So I've tried my best to avoid that completely. Um, also, irreducible hernias tend to present as an emergency quite often, so I don't want that happening either. If I find something is irreducible, I will send them across to a hospital on an urgent basis. The BMI is the single biggest determinant, particularly in inguinal hernias, because the local anesthetic will get absorbed in the adipose tissue. And by the time you get to the area where you have to operate on, the anesthetic has run out of effect and then the patient can find it quite an uncomfortable experience. So I stick to the BMI criteria uh, quite um, rigorously. Recurrent hernias is a bit of a... Um, I don't think it's that difficult, but the local anesthetic doesn't spread through the planes as much, so it can be a little bit difficult, but it's always a direct hernia, which is actually fairly simple to operate because you don't need to dissect out too much of the anatomy. All you need to do is find the sac, uh, push it back and put a mesh on it. Uh, we have uh, then if the patient is very anxious and unable to lie down then I don't offer them surgery. I don't want it to be torture for them. And also the staff also do not enjoy looking after patients who are clearly having a really bad time. And similarly, postural issues, the patient has to be able to give consent for the procedure. So we have all those criteria to exclude in place as well. Uh, incisional hernias are always very complicated, so we tend not, never to do them because you would have a massive struggle trying to do that under um, uh, local anesthetic. Next slide, please. 
So it's a very straightforward local anesthetic technique. There is lots of uh, work available. Some people have been writing uh, very nice um, guidelines about which technique to use. There is nothing special that I use. I um, We do calculate the maximum local anesthetic dose for each patient individually now um, and note it down to make sure that I'm never handed more anesthetic than is safe, but usually uh, we have seen that it is about half the maximum dose of the person that we use in uh, for, for an operation. It's nowhere near the maximal dose um, that we are allowed to use. Uh, next one, please. Um, surgery is the same. I think these are the points that would, would appeal really to a surgeon. Um, I'm, there are some subtle differences in the way you incise, dissect and do the mesh placement. Um, for a wider audience, I'm not certain, but the operation does slow down a lot more. I can normally do an inguinal hernia repair under a general anesthetic in about 20 minutes. The speed has gone up quite a lot because I've done so many under local anesthetic. It takes me 45 to 50 minutes to do a straightforward one under a local anesthetic. And you have to add 10 more minutes if it is difficult for some reason and I'm struggling to get to the cord, etc. The incision is, I only infiltrate the incision and um, I anesthetize that in a straight line down to the external oblique muscle. I use a different mesh to others. Probably I use a pro-grip mesh, uh, which requires less work. It's got little vicryl absorbable tentacles on it. So it doesn't need extra stitching, which saves me time. And my belief is that, that saves the patient uh, money as uh, well. Uh, so it saves the service, um, uh, saves the patient pain as well, because the stitching was what was, in my opinion, causing a lot of pain to the patient. It is, it is, it is though a slightly more expensive way of operating because that mesh itself is a little bit more expensive. Next slide, please. We try to do our best to model care exactly as I would have done it in a hospital. I have, uh, we give the patient preoperative advice um, in writing. I have a 10 minute discussion with the patient about the operation. We do, uh, uh, we ask them to shave the area on the day and then come in. We don't try and tend to shave ourselves just to save time. Uh, we give some dietary advice about what to um, eat after the operation preoperatively. They are not uh, in any, uh, they are not given any advice uh, for that. And uh, we collect uh, feedback from every patient um, via telephone um, about the service that they receive from our practice. Next, please. So that's where I am. If I there is, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to explain to you. And if somebody wants to come to Lincolnshire to observe it, um, observe how the operation is done, uh, we would be happy to host you here. Um, I have been asked in the past to come and operate somewhere else, but I don't think that works because you need to see the whole service. There is no difference in the surgical technique. It is just an inguinal hernia repair. The surgeon would not be interested in seeing me operate. Amit, thank you so, so much. And thank you for taking the slides down as well. Uh, and Lisa and Amit, fantastic, because we're absolutely on time in terms of the agenda. So that's really helpful. I just want to summarise where we are with right procedure, right place. So you, if the outcome is that we need that we want to ensure that we're using our estate well, that we're ensuring that patients are treated in the right place with strict governance and safety as a as a um, as a um, you know rubber stamped objective that that must happen. But in doing that, we start to reduce down the waiting list and actually increase the capacity in theatres to do the more complex. Then the right procedure, right place is the way forward. I think what you've seen, and Amit, you you beautifully have presented it. Your the model of funding, the model of, you know, whether this is uh, any qualified provider, whether in Croydon we've got our um, outpatient suite in uh, the um, 
but almost a community hospital that's been converted. It, it belongs to us and we are doing it. Um, Ken, it's lovely to see you on the call. Um, when I was in Abergavenny uh, doing my elective block, God, it's a long time ago now, 1989, uh, 1990, um, you know, Abergavenny in the old trust, the, the general practice had a huge uh, service that was doing hernias and and in fact they were doing general uh, general anesthetics um in the uh, big general practice site that, that was in Abergavenny so this is not a new conversation um this is a conversation but we just need to bring it back to life so if those are your um if those are your objectives that's what you want to do then how can you do it you need someone who is uh keen to do it so you need a champion you need to make sure the estate is signed off by infection control and by the organisation. But I think you also need to have that shared decision making conversation with patients and patients are now more green. They're worried about carbon emissions. Surgery is the biggest emitter of carbon emissions that we have. Um, and so for patients, the shared decision making a single point of access in, as Amit is saying, where you triage the patients in the right way. Someone sifts through the waiting list and pulls out the patients that could be treated in this way. Uh, for example, for orthopedics, if it's hand surgery, which patients are right to go out? The current Ducatrons may not be the ones to go out. Um, but then that shared decision making with patient, which is, you know, this is your carbon footprint from a general anaesthetic procedure. These are the risks and benefits. And these are the risks and benefits under a local anaesthetic. Patients will choose what they feel is right under the guidance of the surgeon of what we're doing. But in doing that, what you do is you release capacity in your main theatre sites. So, so I'm going to stop there. And if I may, I'm going to open to questions. I'm just going to pick up two conversations from the chat. Um, uh, let me just go back to the conversation of anaesthetic support. So, um, Michael, thank you for your comment. Um, you're right, there is a mixture of staffing within theatres um, and what is safety. So, you know, having a right procedure, right place, a state which is on your hospital site within the building and perhaps, you know, uh, a floor down will have a different staffing need than something that's off site. Um, and Michael, you put in the chat, you know, having consultant level support. So, you know, conversation of one consultant anaesthetist that is there for all the, the lists actually is a very safe way forward and, and a very sensible way forward. So, and there's no prescriptor. You do what you think is right. And there's a, a governance conversation within the organisation. Um, I'm really keen that training follows these patients. So we shouldn't be in a position where our SHOs never see a hernia because they're all being outsourced to independent sector or elsewhere. And then the conversations of I'm the only one who can do this as a consultant because they're not training cases doesn't work. Um, and we're putting great lengths into contracts in the independent sector um, within Eng England and pushing the conversation of training. Um, and then thank you very much, um, We've got the urology procedures. There is a guide. Thank you, Claire, for putting them in. Um, there is a whole list of uh, procedures now that are being done under a local anaesthetic safely um, as we go through. So any other questions into the chats or hands up? Um, and Ken, I'd love your thoughts on this as well. Great. I'm great. Thanks for having your hand up. Uh, Amit, may I bring you in first and then I'll bring in Ken? Sure. Um, just to address the point about training that you had raised, we are we have been very aware that we had, we have taken training away while uh, we were uh, doing these procedures in the community. So we have worked hard in uh, Lincolnshire um, to make sure the training has become available now. The trust has very kindly agreed under a significant amount of pressure from the surgical tutor that the registrars are being released by the trust on this day where they can come and operate with me. So we've started that now since uh, December, January, thanks to a very persistent registrar who really wanted the training. And now everyone wants to do it because they do need the numbers for sign off. And if they get only complex hernias in the in secondary care, then, then they don't tend to get much. So I have had a number of registrars now attending theaters with me on a regular basis. Uh, first, there was a bit of confusion because they thought that this was a this was private practice for me, which it is in a way, but I'm happy to provide training and these are all NHS patients being uh, operated on 
in an NHS uh, facility. The GP practice has been very helpful and very keen to provide this training. And the registrars are great. They have um, the one who has come for about four times. Actually, I all I need to do is get scrubbed and hold the retractors for her, and she is able to complete the hernia repair quite well. If it's particularly difficult, I do step in, but I have got no doubt that if within one or two more uh, uh, days of operating, she would be actually fairly independent. So we would love to roll this service out to our trainees. And I mean, there's always the conversation of, you know, hernias, should we be doing them laparoscopically and, you know, are there better outcomes under general? But this is part of a toolkit. And if you've got patients waiting over a year, giving them a choice of having this under a local anaesthetic or general starts to really turn the dial. But orthopaedics yeah. have really led in this um, in this uh, sphere. Uh, I mean, really I, I, Stella, sorry to uh, interrupt, but I just do not understand. Uh, I, if I see any bilateral hernias, I do offer them surgery under general anaesthetic at a secondary care provider because I do believe that operating on them in one go is better. But you'd be surprised at the number of people who actually say, please don't. Uh, I cannot afford to wait for a year. One hernia is causing me more trouble than the other. Just operate on this because the waiting list is really short. And also, I am not confronted by a massive management um, infrastructure as in a hospital. So if I say to my GP colleagues that actually I'm quite worried about this patient, they're in a lot of pain. Can I do them next week? They say, if you say so, it will get done. So the patient gets the operation next week. But four, five, six weeks is ideal because I don't think we should do surgery before that because people don't have the time to sort their family circumstances out. So a lot of people would cancel the procedure if you give them too quick a date. But four or five weeks is all that it takes for me to get the hernia repair done for them. And they love the service for that reason alone. And Amit, I think what you beautifully articulate is the shared decision making, which is really important. So thank you. Ken, may I bring you in? And then Loretta, please. You're on mute, Ken. Hi, Hi sir. Stella. Nice to see you again. Stella and I were SHOs on rotations in, uh, in Abergavenny um, and Newport many years ago, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. It's really helpful to see your experiences. I mean, I've always been a big believer in this, and this is des you know, desperately the direction we need to travel in, in Wales with the sort of staffing levels, shortages that we have. Um, and it sounds in essence, isn't it, when you would look at the principle, fairly simple, you, know, you move things out of day surgery and you put them into the outpatient setting. It's actually a lot more complicated than that, isn't it? You've touched on a lot of those complexities today. You know, the, the, the availability and, and suitability of alternative sites, the equipment, the skill set you have available and what's needed. And Mike mentioned in the chat room about the you know, making it safe for emergency situations and where that needs to be attached to what sort of procedure. And we're talking about multiple different specialties with different complexities of procedures, the learning curve, training. And from my, Loretta and my point of view, in terms of the sort of all Wales approach, we're looking at a way where we can structure this programme, which makes it easier for people to introduce it. But it's very difficult to do that, isn't it, really? Because it's a very heterogeneous group and availability of all these sort of different things will be different in different health boards and different sites. I mean, you presumably are trying to put some organisation around it yourself. How far have you got with that, do you think? Well, well Ken, do, do you know what? It's, it's really interesting. So, um, and Claire's on the call as well. And um, it, we had exactly the same conversation uh, going back 18 months ago, because I think what we've learned through COVID is that, you know, I'm, I'm National Medical Director of Secondary Care. And, you know, you can put out a principle nationally, that's grand, but what works in Bangor doesn't work down in Cardiff, because Cardiff is really different. It's, you know, and, and if you go out west, it's even, you know, more different because your your population base is different, you, the people that work very different and the number of people that you've got are very different uh, in each of these areas so one size doesn't fit all so Ken I deliberately took the the a different approach so it was let's do what we did well in Covid which is bottom up so if the principle is right procedure right place then you know would you challenge your health boards Ken and say right Let's find and don't say how many, because we didn't. We just put out a plea and said, right, we want to do this. We know people are out there already doing it. We know some people have got want to do it and they've just not been given the air cover. 
newcomers and tell us who wants to be involved. And I just sent out a letter signed by myself and Tim Briggs. We sent out a letter and Ken will help you in any way we can. We sent out a letter that just said, you know, this is what we'd like to do. I know it's mad, but who wants to come and play? And actually 30 people put their hands up. Uh, in fact, I think probably about 40 people put their hands up. Now, 10 have probably fallen way down the wayside. They've not quite done what they've done because they've had to concentrate on other things. But we've had 30 sites that have actually really shown us what they can do. And by doing that, others are now coming on board in that it's becoming standard practice. So the next bit now is to sort out all the niggles that are irritating people that we just need to solve nationally. So the money, uh, give people you know some safe staffing. But Ken, I would start with let's, you know, Wales is you've got big waiting lists and you've got um, people who are really keen. I mean, there are amazing people who are working, who are really keen to do things differently. Give them an opportunity and say, who wants to come and play and see what you get and, and run a, a six to nine month programme, which is discovery. Find out what people are doing and then start to uh, to escalate it above. But can I think if you if you push and say you must do it, people won't do it because they haven't got headspace and actually they're tired. And and we need to give them something exciting to do if they want to do it, I think. Yeah, good point. Yeah, thanks. Tom. Yeah. Uh, Loretta, then Claire. And I'm just yeah. going to say it's seven minutes to the end. So, yes, Loretta, then Claire. Yeah, I was going to say, clearly what you've done in NHS England is is quite a, a coordinated um, uh, approach to this. And what I know across Wales um, is that we are using um, minor procedures rooms for ENT, for hand surgery, for urology, for um, gynae, um, but in a in a for people have been forced to do it because of some of the challenges through COVID. So I think getting that um, sense of what's out there and what's working. But what we didn't do was we didn't record it. So there's a there's a there's a an element of activity. So we can see a shift, and I'll use ENT as an example. Um, we can see a shift from ENT in terms of their inpatient activity. And then when you delve deeper into the service, um, they've actually moved a lot of that work out of theatres completely, but we haven't counted it in the same way. So there's a piece of work going on with our colleagues in DHCW, which are our digital team uh, and our data standards team, because we have to understand what work is going on out there, because as we plan to the future, we need to understand what shifted and therefore what do we need for the future. So I think actually uh, what you did writing out and getting that baseline of what's out there is something that we need to do because there's a lot of it going on, but it's very health board um, driven or not even health board driven. It's service driven out of necessity. Um, I, I think we just need that coordinated understanding of that. So um so it's helpful to understand what, how you did it. And I think there's some work that we need to do in relation to that. And Loretta, I think there's nothing more powerful than that peer-to-peer -peer conversation. You know, if someone's doing it in Swansea, well, why Absolutely. can't we then do it in Newport? It is, is really, really important. Claire, you, you've been the driver of this with Katie, so please do come in. Yeah. Hi, She's the woman um... who's really done the work, so just, just to say. <laughs> No, please don't, please don't big me up like that, Stella. It's big boots. Um, hi, my name's Claire Ogley. I'm a GERFT implementation manager in the GERFT team at NHS England. And yeah, as Stella says, um, I've helped support the Right Procedure, Right Place programme with my colleague Katie McAlain, who can't be here today. Um, Ken Loretta, very happy to pick up this conversation offline around the governments, the organisation, and how we actually went about this from the beginning. Because, you know, if it's if it helps to share how how we did certainly around you know finding the pilots baselining where are we coming from how do we know what change is how do we measure change etc cetera, etc cetera. and then how do we bring others on board because as Stella says this isn't as simple as just bringing out a practical guide well there you go guys off we go it's bringing people to the to the plate to actually do this and so very happy to take it offline Loretta Ken if you want to pick up those conversations Oh, you're on mute, Loretta. 
Yes, definitely, Claire, we will do that. Um, and for, all, for all, the, all the health boards on the call, um, it'd be helpful if you did start to pull that information together um, in relation to what all that really good work that you're doing out there um, and how we then ensure that we record it a, a, appropriately. Uh, and I know there are colleagues on the call that have worked hard trying to get MOPS rooms, particularly the minor uh, procedure rooms over the line. So that criteria that you're using will be really helpful for us as well um, in, in terms of some of the challenges I know that they've faced when they've tried to um, shift activity out. So um, that, that work and that criteria will be really helpful to compare. And I think also, Loretta, I think when you're starting now to work through the digital recording and the the kind of which will then lead to the tariffs for, for that it'd be really good I think Claire to to just link in there as well because we're going through the same trying to understand um how it's recorded so that we can see that shift more formally so it'd be great to make sure that there's a, a joined up approach there yeah, we don't have the tariff in in Wales, but it but from a financial understanding of the differential of the cost. But what we do have is a significant um, theatre staffing challenge. So if we can run more uh, with with uh, with safely less, then that's what we need to look at. So, you know, yeah. that's one of the drivers for us. Certainly, is um, the, the the real staffing challenge that we have in theatres. Uh, but we're also linking in with HEIW, the people who train in Wales as well, around what. That future looks like, and these are important conversations around what those future models might might look like as well, and make sure that we're linked into from a training perspective. No, that would be fabulous, and and the piece of work we're doing at the minute is exactly trying to work through that. If you look on model hospital, how do you pick up that those ENT procedures have moved out? Yeah. So actually, we can see because at the moment we're just completely blind to that, Loretta. So it sounds like you're far more advanced than we are, and it'd be great to learn from you. So uh, we'll we'll pick up on that as well. That'd be really really good. Um, right, Ken. I'm not going to summarise. I'm going to pass it over to you to summarise where you think we are from this, and 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 how we can help. So. Apologies for not telling you I was going to do that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're just summarising what we've just discussed, isn't it, really? You know, our big problem is workforce. That's our major constraint. You know, our theatres, as we've as measured, we have one and a half theatre days per week in every theatre lying fallow. So we have space, you know, we have the space to do this. And as Loretta said, there's a lot of good work out there. But we don't know about a lot of it and it's adopting that best practice and, and there's probably a lot of good ideas out there as well which just haven't materialized into anything so it's capturing all of that isn't it really and then putting it together into some sort of structure and helping to put it together and give people the confidence and the drive and and you know the, the safety netting to be able to do this you know and we can sort of provide that i think at, at our level and from this group yeah so well, ideas on a postcard let's go guys yeah <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, if we can do things together, as I said, Welsh girl, you can never take the Welsh girl out of Wales. Uh, if, if there's anything we can do together, we'd be delighted to do so um, because there's great learning across the piece. We, should, we shouldn't be uh, doing things separately. It'd be great to do it together. So thank you very, very much, everyone. Uh, Alison and Lisa for setting up the call. Um, thank you. Loretta and Ken for your uh, kind invitation uh, to present. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can come back and uh, join one of your calls later on uh, in the middle of the year, if that'd be great. But thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. No, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.